Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Use the chat and tell Diana and me where you're tuning in from. Love to see where people are joining us from. Fall City, Washington. Hello, Sarah. Oh, I can see it now. Oh, there's there you go. Yeah, Saratoga yeah. Springs, New York. Oh, great. Hi, nice. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Austin, Texas. Hello, oh. Ballard. Oh. Hi, Liz. <laughs> Ballard, just round the corner, basically. Exactly. Yes. I very know, close so to where we are. Oh, there's Liz. Yeah, Monica. Hello, Andrew. Let me see. <laughs> Andrew from Santa Monica. Yeah, New Orleans. Hello, Carla. Oh, this is fun, isn't it? I know it is. It's good, isn't it's it? It's different. It's different times in these places. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. same as you. That's right. Totally. And that that's island. Huge. Island. Hello. Hi, Alicia. <laughs> Hello, Simona. Oh, I'm in Wallingford too. Hello, Simona. Lake Placid, New York. Hello. Kirkland. Hello, Donna. Miss you, Donna. <laughs> Oh, they're Western coming Slope, thick and fast. Seattle, oh. Wallingford, hi, Gail. Western Slope of Colorado. Hello, Carol. It's kind of amazing the way we can do this line. I, I know. Just... It's really cool, isn't it? I couldn't talk to these people. Because, like, <laughs> 15 years ago, this wouldn't have been possible. Right? Four years ago, we weren't doing this. Yeah, it's true, show. actually. Hello, Issaquah. All right. Oh, Copenhagen. Hello, Nicolene. Nicolene, I hope Oh, I've my been... God. Oh, Copenhagen. Oh, because I'm going to be talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> The Danish. Southeast <laughs> Washington, hello from Cheyenne, Columbia, Maryland. This is so great. All right, I'm going to go okay. ahead and we'll get started here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder, where we sell all kinds of new and imported cookbooks. And we do a lot of author talks as well. Many of them now are back to being in person, but um, we are still doing some virtual author talks with authors across the sea, like Diana. We have Listen, also, I'd love um, to be there rather than a book. <laughs> there we are. Yes, but then we get all these people from, you know, Maryland That's and New true. York That's and true. Copenhagen who can, who can join <laughs> us. We actually, I did just want to let everyone know, we just added an author talk for next week with Amiko Davies about her new book, Gohan. So if you um, want to join us to talk about that, I know Diana might tune in. Look at her face. It's, a lot, <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. It's so I good. mean, the design is gorgeous on the cover. Very yeah. good. And the food. Um, but we are here today to talk with Diana about her new book, Roast Fig Sugar Snow. We are, are going to leave time for questions, uh, so please be sure to use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen so that I can keep track of the questions as they come up. Use the chat to talk to each other and use the Q&A button to talk to Diana and me, please. Um, and I will also drop a link to the book in the chat. Um, the publisher was kind enough to send us these lovely tote bags with a quote from the book. And so when you order from us, you will get a signed copy and while they last one of these tote bags. So I am going to drop that into the chat right now, in fact. I think and the then, person doing this, the tote bags. I don't think anyone else is doing this. No, it's a very special. <laughs> special. It's a hey, it's a sign of how much everyone loves this book, Diana, that they got this because not I everyone. Think everybody loves book um, so um, and like I said, we will um, also we're recording this, so we're going to add it to our YouTube channel within the next 48 hours or so if you have to pop off early or if you um, want to just watch it again later or share it with a friend. All right. So time to talk about this book. How are you? I'm really good, actually, except it's cold in London. Yeah. It's suddenly, it was like it was a really kind of um, it, it was a bit like an Indian summer until about four days ago. And then just suddenly it went from 21 degrees. I knew that this is not in the right money for you. 21 degrees down to 12. And it's, oh, yeah. I've had to turn my heating on. Yeah. Yeah. Mine came on the other night without me. I had it set like so that only if it got like really, really cold, it was going to come on. And I woke up. I don't know, a few mornings ago and it was on and I knew. Nearly... The good thing is, though, this is the kind of weather I love to cook in. Yes, so it's and it's autumn... perfect time for this book. Exactly, autumn and winter. So this is, um, 
this book first came out with about 18 years ago and this is a new edition yeah. um so tell us if someone already has the first edition of the book besides yeah. this gorgeous color and new design what is new in this edition there are some new recipes not a lot just eight and they were what i did was i took i i mean i didn't put in any recipes that i don't like in the book but i looked at it and i thought you know i've done this all of these recipes since that book was written and i thought you know what i think some of these are better than some of the ones that are in there i prefer them um so i did that i mean there's and i also thought when i was doing that i would like to add some really easy ones like there's a fantastic sausage it's sausage and cream and pasta dish from oh. North, which is in which is in umbria and you might think they don't have snow it's not cold there you have not been to umbria in the winter it is absolutely bloody freezing and that's just that's interesting because it's very very simple but it's nutmeg is this is the um spice in it that changes that and i love nutmeg i really associate it with christmas because we have this thing called bread sauce but to put it in a pasta dish with sausages, I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. But it's delicious. And in fact, even my, we well, just left home actually, but my um, teenage son, the youngest one, he can make that. He made that for me before he left. Oh, that's lovely. So it's easy. It's not difficult at all. So how was it sort of revisiting this book for you? Because it's a really early book in your career. Oh, this and funny... now, sorry, Yeah, it was, a, it was a kind of funny experience because... I hadn't really read it since then. I used the book all the time because the recipes I like. But, um, you know, you don't very often sit down and read your own writing, especially if it's from years ago. And I thought I sounded, oh, it's kind of sweet in a way. I sound very young. I sound very <laughs> earnest. I'm very kind of like heart on sleeve. And that's kind of fine because that's the, the way I was. I'm probably a little bit more cynical now. I don't know, a little bit more weathered. Um. But the other thing I thought was, because I'm busy working on a very big book at the minute, which won't be out till 2026, and I'm tearing my hair out a bit about because it, it's a very long book and there's loads of traveling for it. And I read Roast Fake Sugar Snow and I thought, what is the problem? You knew what you were doing. That was only the third book you'd written. And you've just been yourself and wrote what you wanted. You didn't put so much thinking into it. So that was a bit of a kind of, yeah, that was a lesson. It was interesting to do that. I also, when I read through the recipes, all of them again, I would sometimes think, what does she mean? So that meant that <laughs> I wrote places where I hadn't, I didn't think I'd explain things well enough, or I should have put a little kind of like, you must do this because if you don't, da 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 da. So I put all those bits in, and any recipe that anyone had ever complained about or said they had trouble with, even, um, I retested it and I rewrote it. So the the editor and I we retested quite a few of them, even yeah. ones that we thought does that when you read it does that sound like it will work? Because you get people think that all the recipes well if you're right about food people think all these recipes stay in your head they do not because somebody told me the other day the people who run um eat your books said that they've got five thousand recipes from me kind of stored on their database and that's. I mean, that's a lot of recipes. So, and I use my own books. People think that's funny because like, why would you use your own books? Because I can't, because I can't, can't remember. remember. <laughs> well, I definitely cannot remember. I don't, I don't usually have to read the method, but I need to know the quantities because that's yeah. the kind of thing that really differs. And um, I, I feel now that I've gone through them all and retested some of them. This is something you rarely feel. Um, I feel it's a kind of like, near perfect book somebody is bound to make something like the christmas kringle which isn't an easy thing the danish recipe and say oh i had trouble with this but um i think it's as perfect as it can be unless i was actually standing behind someone holding their hand as they could yeah it sounds so it's, like that's very satisfying right like to get to mm. make it into all that you hoped it could be right well then you see then they came up with oh this so beautiful. And I just, well, it was interesting because I've, my, the designer who's done all my books, um, she got to 60 and she decided to retire. She wants to paint all day. So she's painting now. Oh, wow. She's not doing any more books. She had a complete life change. And then I'm, I thought it was going to be very hard to find someone as good as Miranda. And I got this guy called um, Matt Cox and he's just, he's fantastic. I kind of, 
you know what you really want with a designer is you want someone who you say what you feel the book should be like, what it would make other people feel, and they really get it because they're just very people who are tuned in visually and emotionally. I think that's what you need. And I said I, that the book needed to have a bit of magic because I feel that that sort of food that comes from the snow and food that comes from, you know, the depth of winter. I mean, there's lots of poetry and things in this book. There's bits by Robert Frost. There's bits by people that I was reading when I was even at kind of like junior school. And we we, we liked his stuff like Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Mm -hmm. I liked um, I liked poetry that really noticed those things from an early age. And I like books set there. So I wanted to have those, I wanted to have a kind of slightly otherworldly feel. And then the thing which was hard to get was to feel warm and cold at the same time. So, and I didn't even know if that was achievable, but we put the figs on the cover. He, he was really brilliant. Our illustrator was brilliant. So we got the figs, which feel warm because- Well, and they the, call that, that was the original yeah, cover, and, right? And the color, yes. But yeah. the colors on this, the book, that that part of the cover is warm, the bottom part. Yeah. And then the top part is where there's the snow and the pine trees. And when he showed me this, I just went, This is this is what I wanted it to be like years ago. This is this is it. And yeah. it was hard back, you know, kind of like 18 years ago, it was quite hard to get the right cover. And I was I was happy enough with it. It was fine. But it doesn't do what this does. So even though it's the, I feel treacherous, you see, because the first book should be the one that you really, really love. But I like this one better because it does it does the job better. It is more what I had in my mind all those years ago than the one that actually was published then. So that's okay. good. So all those years ago, you were, you know, this was, I think it was your third book, right? So, yes. and you were, your first book was Crazy, Crazy Water. Water. Pickled lemons. Pickled lemons, which is Mediterranean, right? So yeah. temperature, ingredient, atmosphere wise, completely different. Do you feel like, I mean, was this a reaction to that? Was it sort of? No, I think this, this is what I want to do. Both books were really already there. And when I wrote Crazy Water Pickled Lemons, it was about a lot of both of them were informed by childhood reading in a way. And with Crazy Water Pickle Lemons, it was about, you know, I grew up in Northern Ireland, very grey, pewter skies, nothing exotic. And, you know, then I started reading about pomegranates and things like that. You know, a pomegranate could have been a unicorn for all I knew when I was, you know, very young, eight, nine, and was reading those books. And I I thought a lot about those areas of the world. We didn't travel um, because there was six of us. And at that time in Northern Ireland, you had to go through London to get on anywhere else. You didn't get direct flights from Belfast to anywhere abroad. Um, so it was too expensive. And I, I now regard that as kind of a bonus in life because I just thought so much about places. I thought about being there. I read about them. My head was full of this stuff. And Praise Water Pickle Lemons came about because of, yeah, thinking of those bits of the world that I was not connected to at all. I didn't even know if I'd go there ever um so that came from that and roast fig sugar snow in a more direct way came from childhood reading because um it was laura ingalls wilder and i was read her stuff the first one was um little house in the big woods i've still got my copy of the little house oh, in the big woods we are talking about this diana because oh i yeah. just <laughs> love that stuff and when I read it again as an adult, and I tried to get my kids into it and they weren't interested, um, I was quite surprised because when I read them or when the teacher read them to us when I was small, um, it just seemed like there wasn't, I thought it was full of stories. Actually, it's not. I mean, what they are, a lot of it is about surviving. It's about doing the things you have to do to survive. You've got to put up kind of things when they're there. You've got to get preserves made. You've got to put the pumpkins up in the attic where you'll be able to have them in winter, not just in the autumn. And there was just, I mean, it was a hard life. And, yeah. but because it was in the snow, I think because of there was a togetherness in the family. And I think because the, the two girls in it got on so well. And also because in some kind of ways, this is sound ridiculous, but I was growing up at a much later stage in Northern Ireland, but I also kind of thought it's great when you get a, you know, a kind of like tangerine in the toe of your stocking on Christmas morning. 
it was I could see what they were getting was was wonderful and was otherworldly to them and was you know beautiful and exciting and then so much of it was set in snow and the I'd never had it at the time but the whole section about maple syrup and being at it going making sugar on snow by boiling the syrup up to a certain temperature and then pouring it in I mean it's gorgeous it's lovely yeah. and I thought about that for years and I eventually did go to Vermont, but I think I was like, I was like 35 when I went to Vermont and, and saw it actually happening. I went to sugar on snow parties, but I think there's just, it's a very pure product. If you think about it, it's just sap and then it's boiled and then it's put into cans or there's plastic jar, the plastic kind of like bottles and that's it. But it, it tastes so much. And this is an odd thing. It tastes for me so much of autumn because it's like leaves, yeah. it's like bunny leaves, but it's actually made in the cusp between winter and spring. Yeah. And um, I think I can I, I think that's wonderful. I and I did manage to get some maple syrup around the time that we were kind of reading it at school, and I thought it was delicious. You know, we started having it in pancakes and stuff like that. But it's just it's it's a, a it's a delicious and very unique product. But also, I just, I like those worlds. I liked worlds that were full of snow, where you were kind of cut off. And it was interesting when I started to work on the book. Um, I find that some places where they were particularly cut off, like mountainous areas. So if you look at kind of Friuli or you look at the French Alps in the Savoie, you, dishes stay more the same there than they do in other places necessarily other places are having kind of like an influx of this people an influx of that people people are going there it's not inaccessible but in but in snowy areas and mountainous areas they they still cook a lot of old-fashioned dishes because mm -hmm. because they've not been they've not been so open to other influences and also and it's harder snow, to get things there yeah that is yeah that's true that's another <laughs> thing and also the food works in those areas because the food, quite a lot of it is, you know, carb, pretty carb heavy. And, you know, you would only really have tarty flat in the Savoie if you, you know, you can only have that if you've been out walking all day in the snow or skiing or whatever. And there's something, there's something about that reward after you've been freezing and you feel exhausted and your bones are sore and you've been wet, and you know, ending up on your bottom in snow half the day. <laughs> There's a real pleasure in that. So I think a lot of the a lot of the recipes in here are about kind of like rewards in a way. Mm -hmm. And it, and I think in I've been thinking a lot about this actually. I don't think we're very within the UK, I don't think we're very good at winter. I don't think we're good at wintering in a way. I think we do an awful lot of moaning and we talk about you know we're too hot in the summer and then it gets then it gets to kind of autumn and winter and we're too cold and we're too, and cold, too wet bad. yeah and i think <laughs> that we i think that we follow along that kind of path like sheep when in fact there's there's masses to be said for autumn and winter food i mean they're my favorite times of year to cook for a start because in the summer you kind of avoid cooking as much as possible you know tomato salad you can have that for three months if you want to um but there's a retreat into warm places when it gets as cold as it is now in London. And I like that. Um, you invite people around for dinner, but I go out less because it's like, is it worth going out tonight? I'm too cold. And the kind of thing of making slower food in the kitchen, it's not that it's more work. It's just that things cook and they kind of like, their flavors become layered. If you're doing a pot of stew and it's kind of like you layer the flavors up and then the time that it takes makes it into something that becomes more than the sum of its parts in a way. Right. Um, and I think that that kind of cooking where you're in the in kind of the corner of the sofa or doing whatever else you want in the kitchen and you can smell that change taking place is really lovely. I just yeah. think coziness, I mean, this sounds simplistic in a way, but I think to be cozy is very important. And also to withdraw part of the year is very important because then I think, you, you don't just kind of like get your energy up again. You can replenish that, but you're more thoughtful. You're more, you contemplate more. And yeah. I think after all that running around in the summer, I think it's quite good to go back into that kind of stage. And I think I probably grew up with that stage 
quite a lot because, you know, we didn't have great weather. So I was used to home, the homely feeling being about the warmth of the kitchen. Yeah, I absolutely. Cooking. Totally. Well, and what you're describing is also, um, you know, like the Scandinavians obviously do winter very well because they that just accept that it. that's, and since in the time since you wrote this book, this whole idea of, I'm going to say it completely wrong, but Huga, right? Like had a very trendy moment. Yes. <laughs> and so that's a bit of a pity because I had a trendy moment and it's kind of, I know everybody was sick of listening to it, but yeah. that was kind of, I thought that from the first time I went to Scandinavia, the first country I went to was um, Denmark. And we got from the airport, as we drove from the airport, the sn it really started snowing heavily and they thought roads were going to close and everything. So I got to our hotel in Copenhagen. And the first thing I sort of noticed was in the blocks of kind of like flats around our hotel, everybody had candles in the windows. Yeah. And I said, do you think they're all having parties? Do you think it's a festival? It wasn't. It was just kind of like a Monday night in Copenhagen. And we were there too late to go to the restaurant in the hotel. So they brought us up room service with more candles. And the dish that's in the book actually was what they brought. It was, um, I serve it in there, I would suggest serving it with potatoes. But it's um, it's roast pork, Danish roast pork with pickled oh, right. greens and quick pickled cucumber. And I tasted it. And those kind of, I love the combination of um, sweet and savory together. And you get that in a major kind of way. Um, and they served it with rye bread. It wasn't with any other vegetables or anything. And I at first kind of thought, this is they really, they really love pork. There's not much else except the pork. And um, with very cold beer. And I, I thought it was my first flavor of Scandinavian food. And I thought it was really wonderful. But I could see, yes, look at it. So good. <laughs> but I could see almost immediately that they did, I mean. They just did winter very well. You go out and you walk around and you will you will know the cafes are nearby because you are led by the nose. And you can smell cardamom and you can smell cinnamon. And even at 10 o'clock in the morning, all the cafes have got tea lights on in them. And I think they really embrace it. The Time Life book about Scandinavian food, which is Yonksol, but I got it somewhere on the internet secondhand. And there's a line in that that says, um, food is a Scandinavian antidote to darkness. And I get that. I think that's very true. I think they think about, well, I think they think about warmth a lot as well and holding mm -hmm. kind of like chocolate or coffee in your, in your, you know, your, in your hands and getting the heat from that. But I think they really do see food in that, in that kind of way. And I also think it's, it's partly why maybe um, Danish baking is very good. I was really impressed and have always been with, you know, the whole range of Danish pastries and stuff like that. But also the really, I mean, really good, you know, Ruger brought really good rye bread, mm -hmm. the stuff that's got quite a lot of seeds in it. That is, I mean, that's solid. Not to mean that it's not, it, it's not absolutely gorgeous, but it's not baguette, you know. It's right. there to give you some kind of ballast and um, and some kind of sustenance, I think, as well, more than you might think you need, perhaps. But I think these things have, well, you know, they've been really used to it, kind of like, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, they've all had to cope with snow and um and darkness. So and darkness. Lots of darkness. Oh my god. I we did I was in northern Sweden actually for some of the research for this book. And I couldn't believe that because you got up, you, you kind of like got downstairs for breakfast at about kind of half past nine. And it seemed as if it wasn't it wasn't quite light yet. And then it never really did get quite light. And by the two o'clock in the afternoon you thought the day was over again so I mean they must adjust to that but for me I found that really really hard because as soon as it got dark again I would feel sleepy because you know that's the signal it was giving me but yes that that whole thing of being I've never been so far north that I've been in darkness for 24 hours mm -hmm. I have been there at the other end of the yeah. kind of like scale when it's when it's light all day and you can't which is amazing bed. no yeah. I know that then you go sort of crazy in a way. But you, <laughs> you probably go crazy actually in the dark as well. Um, because I don't think we're necessarily designed to like that. But I think we do have to nearly everybody finds that the light has changed really quickly here just recently. Yeah. Summer was over very suddenly, and then it suddenly was getting kind of like dark at about five o'clock. Um, and I think we find that 
sudden and difficult. But I think that I think that good eating can help with that. Yeah. And this is the time of year I start baking again. I mean, I do bake in the summer, but not much. But yeah, now same. it's it's kind of like, yeah, it's this is the time to do it. So the book itself is, I mean, I always think of this as being, it's sort of like your moodiest book, I guess. It's very evocative of a specific time of year, obviously, of yeah. these places. But it's also... Um, a little I'm a little rambly here but i always find your writing sort of very beautifully walks that line of like your prose is very descriptive without being really flowery so for example oh, like your like your table of contents right where you could just have done it like straight up ingredients you know pumpkins pork plums whatever it's you know earthly pleasures pumpkin squash beans and lentils you know, tales from the hunt, game and wild mushrooms, winter on your tongue, herbs, spices, and sour cream. So it's like you. I I'm not sure what my what my question is here, but um, how do you walk that line of like why is it important to you that it that that, that it have that it be a little bit literary as well as descriptive? Because um, because I love prose and I love kind of poetry and bits of travel travelogue from other people as well. Um, and I just, I think food is not just food. I mean, I could have, as you say, written, and, and I wouldn't force it if I hadn't thought, oh, I'd like to use these, these titles instead. I would never kind of push that so it sounded ridiculous. And I can see sometimes that other writers do, and I think, no, you don't go there. But it is a fine line between writing purple prose, which is just which we would laugh at and then writing stuff which is just very solid and basic and I think in the the recipes as well they're not very lyrical or floral and that was a deliberate decision because you you could do that you could kind of talk about a handful of this and you know or a fistful or whatever but I know a lot of I know a lot of people who aren't very good cooks and they need all the help they can get so I made a decision that the that the recipes themselves and all my books should be very clear and people should be able to follow them very well and but those are set in the context of this is what this food will make you feel like this is where it's from this is kind of like the identity it has and and also i i definitely want to take people places um i think growing up in northern ireland and not going anywhere gave me this kind of great sense of yearning so that when i went places abroad eventually they just seemed amazing to me. I mean, it's ridiculous. I can I went to Paris recently actually with my sons. And um I first went to Paris when I was kind of like had finished au pairing in Bordeaux, so I'd been there for a year. And then I went to Paris and lived with a friend who'd been au pairing in Paris. So you'd think I'd kind of like been there often enough now to be kind of bored of it or at least to be blase. But my youngest had not been before. And there was one evening where we we kind of like had done we hadn't done our timings very well. We had to get to dinner, but we also had put down we wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. So I said, okay, just let's get in an Uber. Just let's get in an Uber. And so all you do is put in Eiffel Tower, which seems amazing in itself. That's all you have to put as the address. And as we were nearing it, you could see down kind of like small streets, you could see it rising from the end of the street. So you got glimpses of this huge thing. And then we got there and he left us closer than I've ever been. I think the taxi driver and it was lit up. And as we got out, it started to do that sparkly thing. So it started to, you know, the thing they do every hour. They kind of go, yeah, kind of, yeah the glitter thing. And I just went, boys, this was like meant to be. Look, we just got out of the car. We can only be here for about 15 minutes. And it's glittering. <laughs> and I just, I can't, and they were excited as well. And Ted's 25 and he's kind of like a soldier who's also a medic. So it's kind of like, he's not, he's much given to these things. Um, But I just, I thought it was wonderful. And so, so did they. And so especially did Gillies, my youngest. So I think, I think I want to take people places because I think, I don't think so many places are wonderful. I mean, I can't, I can't say it any more than that really. And I'm not sure that everybody always notices because we're so we're so used to stuff and we're so used to stuff that is kind of extraordinary because now 
you know, kids get annoyed now if they haven't been to Disney by the time they're sort of six years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm not on for that at all. I just yeah. think the world is full of possibilities, great places to go, great dishes to discover, great kind of histories of particular kind of areas. And I want to get that in because I think that's not because I think I should be encyclopedic or anything, but because I think if we're going to go to these places, let, let's go to these places. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, and it's also, I think, the ingredients of those places and of these seasons. Um, I think for some people, a lot of these are a hard sell, right? It's root vegetables, it's dark greens, it's bitter leaves. But I think that those are an easier sell 18 years later than they were 18 years ago. And I just wonder if, did yeah, you I have any... Sense. No, What's I that? didn't. Know when I kind of, I, I hadn't thought that it might, they might be an easier sell now than they were then, because I think here we're still very steeped in Middle Eastern food, and that's not bad. I mean, it's very, very healthy, and your time has done a great job of kind of like <laughs> yeah, right. putting it out there. But it was one of the reasons I wanted to do that when I started to do it. It was like if you live in, if you live in the UK, or if you live in kind of like specific parts of America as well. Um, you've got these very basic things, you know, you have root veg, you've got beets, you've got, well, certainly in Italy, you've got bitter, bitter greens, but you've got, you know, cabbage, all these kind of things that we feel, oh, it's kind of dumpy kind of weather, it's brown, mm -hmm. good and sort of brown. And I didn't, I didn't feel that about them. And I felt we were, we were focusing too much. I mean, we've been focusing on the Mediterranean for a long, long time. Yeah. And we're and doing um, it even more now, blue zones. All the oh, I know because um, <laughs> but it just seemed to be a bit mad. I mean, I roast Mediterranean vegetables as much as anybody else. I don't, in fact, know what we ate before we had were able to roast Mediterranean vegetables. <laughs> but I think that we have our own, our own ingredients. You know, parsnips and carrots and things which I grew up with, but even then thought it was quite boring. But you look at what they do with these in other countries. Like I've done a lot of traveling over the last couple of years in northern Germany. And everybody goes, German food, nobody cares about it. They do fantastic things. You just have to kind of, if you go and you look at home cooking in someone else's land, in someone else's region, you find things that you think, oh, I could I could do that. That'd be brilliant. Like there's, it's, it's not in this book actually, but I do a dish that's sausages and kind of like crushed ginger snaps and beer. And that doesn't sound immediately delicious. <laughs> But it is, no, it is really wonderful. <laughs> you have that with lots of kale and stuff like that. Um, and it's just, it makes sense to eat what's on our doorstep because it makes sense in terms of, you know, the planet. But also, I don't I don't think it's a good idea to live in your bit of the world and always to be thinking, I want things from here. I want things from there. I want things from everywhere. And it's difficult to push against that because, you know, I promote that to a certain extent because I write about food. So it's always, you know, miso and gochujang and everything, all these kind of like new things. And I don't know what it's like in the States, whether it differs, but here there is a massive appetite for new flavors. I oh, think yeah. we've, we've always been like that kind of because, you know, people came here from India and Pakistan and everything. And we just, and, the, and then the, the British were abroad. We just kind of like stole these things like magpies and brought them back home. Um, so we're like that anyway. But it's harder for us to like our own stuff, I think, in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think you're missing out if you haven't, you know, if you haven't made a, there's a recipe for it in there, a Dublin coddle, which is, you know, sausages and black pudding and um, potatoes, basically, all kind of cooked in a broth. That is so good. It's not the only thing you're going to eat. You've got to have the cabbage on side and you've got to have your vegetables, but that is that does what it's supposed to it sort of gives you it's coddled it's which is kind of like poached really nicely and it's it's a hug really that's a hug of a dish well and um i was just gonna see if i can find a picture of it but I oh, there's, there's no picture of the there's not a picture of it so never no. mind <laughs> um well and it's also um i think like i'm married to a, a brit who I, he, when I say these vegetables are a hard sell, like this is a man who just thinks like, you know, he will never eat a Brussels sprout because I think the only way he ever ate it was like boiled beyond, you know, oh, no. <laughs> recognition, no. right? It's that, it's that, I, you know, you were sort of raised on it a certain way and therefore, and so yeah, that's why yeah. I think 
books like this one are so useful for helping people, I think, like reframe what they think about that, that thing kind of they thing. hated when they were a kid, right? Because it's like a different way to try it. It's also eating it, I think, like in season and in its context. Yes. And that's, I think, is one of the things this book does so beautifully. So along with sort of the recipe, just the chapter titles, you one of the things that I think is also just like a, a hallmark of a Diana Henry book is that, you know, it's not just here's what these kinds of vegetables are good for. It's a lot of research about the history of it, the context in terms of like it's used this way in this country and this way in another country. Oh, no, I love finding How did that become that. important to you? Have you just always been someone who who no, sought out sort that. of no, I've always yeah? been that. and I've always thought about I know it's a kind of madness in a way. I think I've always thought about flavors a lot. And if I can do, I still do this. If I can do this thing with this ingredient, okay, what else could I do with it? And in fact, in my, because I write, um, I've got a weekly column here in a national newspaper. And um, I kind of knew that I was doing this thing, which wasn't, which wasn't the best writing, but it was because I wanted to give people all the options. I'd say, you know, and if you can do this with it, hey, you should try with this and hey, you should try with this. But then your column ends up just being lists of stuff. But I really wanted people to try and to think about um, ingredients, not just in one form, but to think about them really broadly, where they could go. And um, so I, I do this thing and my children, I didn't really know that I did this. They call this a mind map, and they, that, that's what they use, the phrase that they use at school. But I had this thing of putting, like, just because I kind of fancied doing it, it was a bit of fun, or because um, a magazine had asked me, I'll put an ingredient in a circle in the middle of a page, and it might be rhubarb, and then I'll start with all of these spikes mm -hmm. off it. And I'll put first, I'll put all the things that are tried and tested ways to use rhubarb, you know, ginger, orange, bloody blah. blah. And then on the other side, I would put all the things you thought it might go with, but possibly not. Mm -hmm. um, I did this fact because I talked to Melissa Clark from the New York Times about this. And we talked about, she loves anchovies. So she's always thinking of ways to use anchovies. And um, she does a similar kind of thing. Because sometimes Melissa, I'll see, and I've said, Melissa, you've put anchovies with mushrooms. And I hadn't thought of that at all. She's, yeah, they're delicious. They're delicious. But I think that's a thing that most people who write about food, I think they they do that. I don't necessarily think chefs, bless them, have got the time always to think about that. Um, but kind of for, for those of us who just write about food and can like go all over the place, we're just always doing this. We're picking things up. And I don't always want it to be a way of treating it, which is unusual for the sake of it. I want right. it to work properly um and yeah I, I think I think I've always been like that I've always thought about how you can use an ingredient and if you can build one meal out of something what else what other meals can you build out of that yeah and that's where in this book it's so funny that just those chapter headers are like full of recipe ideas right like so literally last night I was sitting here prepping for this with my, and I, ha I will tell you, I sat down, I poured myself a little whiskey. I lit a candle. Cause I was like, <laughs> I'm going to set the mood, okay. <laughs> but I hadn't, David and I had not had dinner and I was like flipping through the mushroom chapter. And you said something about like, you can just take some mushrooms and cook them in oil and then add some butter and some sherry and some cream and put it over pasta. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to go do that right now. And I literally like <laughs> Did it. Like 15 minutes later, we had delicious dinner, right? Yeah. So it's like, I think when people just go to the recipes in your books in particular and don't read all that thing, I think Americans in particular are not used to books having so much outside the recipe in the narrative sort of pieces of it. it like, um, so thank you for that. Oh, and no, that's good. I kind of, lo I love that you said that because also when I'm writing those chapters, they're not supposed to be just kind of lyrical and here we're escaping here blah 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 right but they should also that it's it's also they i should also be offering ideas all the time because i don't know if i've thought of it why would i not tell anybody else you know it's kind of like let's share the joy let's get this out there this is what you can do with this ingredient yeah yeah well yeah and i think like i said it's that um the, the it sets you up for what's coming in the recipes as well right because you've you yes. sort of set the stage for 
you know, the way that this ingredient's used in a particular country. And so then when you yeah. get to the recipe, it's like, okay, here it is. We're, we're going to do it now, which is. I mean, horseradish is a case in point. Horseradish, yeah. we don't hear it with beef. Um, in Northeast Italy, they would have horseradish on pork there. In New England, um, the Cape Verdeans, who are a lot of kind of like people who, who, um, pick the cranberries. They're either a Cape Verdean or from kind of like descendants of them. They think that you should eat cranberries with roast pork at the end of not with turkey. And then in Russia, um, they put horseradish and cranberries together, and they have that with beef. So right. the way that things cross over all kind of like across the globe is very is very interesting to me, really. Yeah. No, totally. Um, you mentioned earlier that you have sort of poetry and quotes and things throughout the book. So you've got um, the William Carlos William one that I love about the plum. Everybody <laughs> Everyone loves that. But so are you someone who sort of collects those little tidbits as you find them? Or did you go out and find things specifically for this book? I did. I did a kind of like mixture. I think for this book, mostly I have the things because I like that. Um, I had a lot of sn snowy places that could be referred to. And I had, you know, kind of like Miss Miller's feeling for snow and things like that. And when I was younger, I really loved Edward Thomas because I don't know how many po poems he wrote about, about snow, but there seemed to be a lot. And I loved Robert Frost, but it was more difficult with Crazy Water Pickle Lemons. I mean, I would do this kind of thing, which would be just Google certain words. I would kind of like Google pick a lemons and see what came up or I'd Google saffron and see what came up. And I was quite often buying books that were about those or had those mentioned, but I didn't really know what I was getting. And then you find this, you would come across this great stuff, like in crazy water pickle lemons, there's, there's a part of a poem by this Iranian woman and it's all about pickle jars. It's about the vegetables gossiping in vinegar and I've never forgotten that because that's the way they sit on her shelves and her kind of like pantry. And if you think some of them are really quite fat, you know, fat like little um, turnips and fat right. little beets. And you can imagine them kind of like talking to each other. But I did come across stuff that was really beautiful. I mean, there's another there's another Iranian book that I that I bought. And the woman was her kind of like description of... Um, you know, the layered phyllo pie of pastry, how she described that was just really beautiful. So I do try to find, if I can, um, other people's views of certain ingredients or certain dishes. And I, th I just like doing that. But yeah. that's useful that it kind of goes in the book anyway. I don't do it, I don't do it as much now because it was very much in those two books and I'm doing another big book at the minute, which which could have that kind of thing in it. But it's so expensive. I mean, I have to clear oh, right. them and then you have to pay for them. And that's really hard. But I'm kind of glad that I did Crazy Water and Roast Figs and they both had all those things in them and they haven't, they're, they still have, even in re new editions, they've still got the, the poetry yeah. and the other kind of prose. Yeah. Well, I think it does, again, it's just another element that adds to that sort of real sense of time and place and um the real feelings that these sort of that the ingredients and the weather and the time of year can evoke in people right yeah, so um yeah as a fellow sort of lover of the cold seasons as well there are more, and there are more of us than you would imagine actually I, I i was being feed by an american yesterday and he was saying when we do books they about the cold cold season cooking then it's just Halloween and then suddenly you're at Thanksgiving yeah and um, he said but you've kind of done gone further than that but I think that's partly because we think of the cooking that you do in the cold weather that's what we think of we have Guy Fawkes in between those two we don't have Thanksgiving we have Christmas gets to January everybody just feels miserable they don't think right. what it is that they could cook that would be really wonderful so that food goes on for a long time after those you know after those festivities and I, I'm sorry that some of them don't last longer. I mean, we could actually have cranberries right into kind of the end of winter. And there are not there are not that many fruit and vegetables around, especially fruits, actually. You've kind of got quite a limited um, kind of array. And if I had, what I do is actually I buy cranberries and I put them in the freezer. So I still have them in all of the winter months. 
But, you know, you can't get them in the supermarket after Christmas. That's the end of it. Yeah. I think that's a pity, really, to kind of not have those things. Well, in January, it seems like, um, especially in the UK, you know, it is here too. It's because, you know, it's everybody's thinking new year, new you, you know, and like veganuary and January has become this time of just like, I don't know, just like really, um, well, it's like diet season, right? Or it's like the time to like deprive yourself after it is, all of the, the joy, right? Season. Yeah, because then everybody stops drinking as well. It's kind of like, January is difficult enough. It's really dark. There's not much to look forward to. You know, Easter's a long way away. And most of us don't make a big fuss about Easter anyway. And so this is kind of, this is this is hard to get through. And you're going to remove all the pleasure? I mean, that's just mad. Yeah. I think even more in January, you have to be good to yourself and you have to think of the good things to eat. It doesn't mean that it has to be kind of like really carb heavy. Um, because there's lots of salads in here as well. I love winter salads as well you know, using pumpkin and dried cranberries and that kind of thing. Because not everything in here at all is kind of what I would call kind of hefty or rib sticking. I mean, there are dishes like that, but there's a lot of, there's also a lot of color. You know, we, people think that the winter, winter food and autumnal food is quite brown, but you think when it gets to January, um, you still got pomegranates, You've got beets, you've got those incredible bitter leaves, you know, Treviso yeah. and everything, the red, the crimson things. And um, well, here at the minute, we still have figs, actually, even though it's October now. I was out at the weekend and we, I went to a restaurant and they had venison with celeriac and black figs and bitter leaves. So there's a whole page of, a whole plate of crimson. And I think Beautiful. If, you, if you just shift your mindset a bit, you can see how beautiful these things are. And it doesn't always have to be, you don't have, don't have to have months of these brown pies. And a lot of those, I think also in the winter, what we need um, is we need our taste buds woken up. But that's good because here, I mean, it's traditional here to get Seville oranges in to make marmalade. That's when people do that. They do that in January and February. Right. Um, and and then we have forced rhubarb, which is a February thing. So that's kind of those really candy pink, slim ones of rhubarb. I know you don't have that there, do you? you We're starting to get rhubarb. it more, at least here in Seattle. We don't get the really early forced rhubarb. We get it. It doesn't show up for us until like maybe April, but um, okay. or April or May. But we are starting. Some some growers are starting to do it. But we've got bit. there's all of those kind of colors to country yeah. with, so there's no need for your food to look uh, they just there's no reason why it should be like that well and you have the pear salad with the hazelnuts and the blue cheese oh yeah that, um, that's with irish cashel blue cheese but it doesn't have to be that it can be another blue cheese and the dressing for this is so delicious and i use it on a lot of other things because it's the um sort of hazelnut oil or walnut oil yeah. Base yeah. rather than olive oil and that can even just be something that adds that sort of warmth and nutty taste to leaves or I know because there's a whole chapter in there about nuts actually which I didn't I wasn't really aware that I cook so much with nuts until I started to think about that book that I have more than other people because you've got to if you're going to have nuts you've got to get through them quite quickly because they go rancid especially walnuts um but yeah I've got I've always got bags of walnuts pecans hazelnuts they have such different different kind of voices if you think about a hazelnut it's like a kind of it's like a little soprano you know it's up there um, <laughs> and then in comparison the walnut is really down there I mean he's kind of like the, walnut is the king of nuts and it's like that in the middle east and um, that's its reputation but it has you know it's there's a tannin in the skin that that kind of covers the nuts the halves and um, which the the skin in a hazelnut is not bitter. It's kind of nutty and slightly burnt in a way. But they also, I just, there's so much that can be done with those. I mean, there's a recipe in the book for um, Ayad. And some people have said, that's kind of funny because you it's from the southwest, southwest France. But it's cold there as well. And I know because I've been there. <laughs> These but places have just, seasons. Like, um, that's pounded walnuts. And 
quite a lot of garlic and it's got walnut oil in it, plenty of kind of like salt and pepper. And sometimes I also add a little bit of, um, you know, really reduced chicken stock to it. But if you make that and you and you cook that and you um, offer it with um, duck breast or little quails or even kind of guinea fowl, that's not that doesn't make you immediately think wintry, but that is very much a, an ingredient that's used in that area in, in yeah. the cold weather and it's delicious. Yeah. So the book is for cooking sort of all winter and fall and beyond the holidays. But if we were sorting going to use it for menu planning for the holidays, what are some of your favorite things? For your holidays. Sure. Yes. In America. So we've got people from everywhere. I will endorse the pear, pecan and pear upside down cake as a fantastic yeah, that's Christmas good. Or Thanksgiving um, breakfast, really indulgent breakfast. There isn't a picture of this. I'm just looking through and liking that's things. Okay. Through. Um, a salad of smoked duck. I mean, this this mm -hmm. dish, um, that this comes from Friuli, so the northeast of Italy, and they're very that's very well known for kind of smoked duck and smoked goose and things like that, and also smoked ricotta. I think smokiness, it's just a real autumnal ingredient. And this is really elegant. It uses um, farro, although you could use barley as well. And you don't have to smoke the duck. You can find, well, I don't know what you can find there, but you can certainly find it here. And it's got one of those nutty dressings. And because it's got the pomegranates, it looks, I think that's a brilliant starter. It looks quite spectacular. I mean, America, I had quite a lot of influence on me in this book, in that you like, like I love wild rice. I, and I didn't discover that till I came, and I went to America the first time when I was 30. And I made lots of notes when I was on that trip. And one of the things I kept loving about the States is the salads. Mm -hmm. And so they were kind of like wild rice with, you know, pork or whatever, and cranberries, dried cranberries. cranberries. Yeah, always cranberries. So I, yeah. I, kind of, I really love that. But the one which I would be cooking if I was going to be at home this Christmas, and I'm not, um, is the goose. The goose with mm. the prune and rye stuffing. Um, goose, I just I just love the meat. It's kind of like it's it's way better than than turkey meat, and it stays tender. And the fattiness actually is one of the good things about it. It means it loses a lot of fat that you have to take out, and that's that's kind of like I've always got kind of like help on hand to help me with fat. But roast goose with brandied fig, chestnut, you can use um, prunes instead of figs, chestnut and rice stuffing is just, I don't know, it's like, it's like food from another age, slightly. And then to make the gravy, you use um, calvados and your own goose stock and things. But it just, I like the, I like the oldness of that feeling as a dish. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also in here, there is my... English ale soot Christmas pudding. Yeah, and I was honestly, looking at that one. Really, that I mean, this, this it's it's very immodest. That dish is fantastic because I started to make that when I was about twenty, and I've been changing it ever since. So I've kind of like changed and perfected it over the years. And this and, is your most recent version of it. Uh, this yeah, is how I you do. make it now. Yeah, absolutely, and okay. um, it's um made with. Well, it's got treacle and things like that. But it also has, to make it really moist, it's got mashed banana and grated apple. And I think you've got to get the best dried fruit that you can. And they do have, in, in Scandinavia, in some of the Scandinavian countries, they have a thing called a Christmas beer. I don't know if you have a Christmas beer in the United States. Some of the some of the smaller breweries here, the local okay. ones make one. Yeah, we get uh, that as well here. They have to be kind of like smaller ones. But yeah. the... The beers that are quite spicy or even quite chocolatey. Yeah. And they've got to be soaked for a week before you start kind of like putting them into the pudding. But it's an incredibly easy thing to make. I don't know why more people don't do it. You've just got a kind of, you've got a bit of creaming of the butter and sugar and then you put all the dry ingredients in and then all the fruit and you just, you just, you know, you just stir it around and then you put it in your bowl. The hardest thing is to get the, have you ever made it? Christmas oh, pudding. I make it every year. Do you want to say? I haven't made your recipe. I have always made the Delia Smith one from okay, that Christmas so book. I'm many sure years that's ago. very good. I'm going to make know. yours this year, though. 
the hardest bit is to get do the kind of pleat thing in the top exactly. get the string on but you need somebody to help you with that yeah and then that's kind of fine but last year it got to Christmas and I was we were having it here in London but I was so exhausted I did something I'd not ever done before because I wouldn't allow myself I said to my sister shall we just order a pudding should we order it I won't I, I just feel too tired to do it and she finds somebody who was award-winning, da 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 da, and we got it in, and we cooked it on the day, and it's like, it's like, oh god, no, it's just not our Christmas pudding. It's just okay. Yeah. Um, because mine's very, it's very high in booze. It's very very moist, and um, I think it's one of my favorite things to eat. It's a good job it's only around at Christmas though, because I could probably eat that for days, and that really wouldn't be very good for me. But well, it is but it's delicious. it lasts too. I mean, that's the oh, yeah, thing. because there's like, so much booze in it. Oh, it, yeah. It's I mean, it's, like, you can still be eating it for a fortnight. No, you can, which is actually, I think, kind of one of the nice things about And it doesn't degrade, right? Like, it just, no, it's just it the same. It's just delicious. Um, so, we have a couple of audience questions here. De Deborah would like to know what or who is inspiring what you are cooking now going into this winter? Oh, the other writers, you mean? Uh, yes. Or is there like a? I, she says, "What or who?" So, I it could be an other writer. It could be favorite ingredients. You know, an ingredient I or a that. trip you've been on. I suppose it's. I mean, it's all my American friends always go, "Oh God, Diana, the pumpkin. Start with the pumpkin." I really love pumpkin and squash because I didn't grow up with them. I mean, they were like. You know, I thought there were things Exotic. that you know, <laughs> Cinderella went into one yeah. that was made to cook for her. Um, and it's it's sweet and I love the I love the texture of the flesh. It's so, you know, it's velvet. Um and my favorite, I don't know what you get there, but my favorite is a is one here called Crime Prince. But I love it for I love it with salty things. So there's a recipe in there for it with pasta and ricotta and smoked cheese, smoked grated mm -hmm. cheese. Yeah. which is like something I had in Friuli, but there they have smoked ricotta. Here it's very hard to get. So I just had to do my own version. And then just the combination of the, you know, the milkiness of the ricotta, the smokiness of the cheese, and then that gorgeous, sweet and velvety flesh of the pumpkin. I think that's delicious. A lot of cooking, I think, even if they're only small, a lot of it's about contrast. That's what I think all the time. So you're always thinking about, okay, what will you balance that out with? Or what will you have clashing with it even? But it's all about what you put together. And that's a very simple dish. But it's just better than just pumpkin with pasta, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's just more to it. And I love wild mushrooms. I mean, I made my first wild mushroom sauce at the weekend to have with roast chicken. And um, I've got wild mushroom risotto down to have on tomorrow night here um and I love pears um they're kind of like I think people ignore them a bit you know they're not you know they're not kind of like bright and cheeky the way apples are they're all kind of you know a bit sleepy and all the weight is in its bottom and it's <laughs> gonna pop it and wake it up but when you um there's a recipe in there actually that's lovely and all it's kind of poire savoyard savoyard and all you do is you bake pears in cream and sugar and in a gratin dish and um you don't think it's going to become anything and it becomes like absolutely wonderful there's vanilla in it as well yeah. um and I do love I love them baked with all different sorts of things I like them I mean this is the time I use quite a lot of booze in cooking it's not because I'm kind of like a particularly boozy person but I just like what it can do pears in marsala bake, bake pears in marsala that's something I really like at this time of year and pears and red wine and I'll start making because it seems it's a bit counterintuitive to have jellies in the autumn and the winter you think that's you know with more kind of like maybe the spring because you can they make beautiful uh rhubarb makes a kind of like gorgeous jelly yeah but cranberries cranberry and port make a kind of I like all those yeah those quite kind of British boozy things like port and Madeira and you know they're quite they're quite deeply flavored, like tawny port and Madeira aren't that much different, but they make you think of nuts and leaves and that kind of thing. And I think pears in particular are great at sucking up flavors that are around them. I mean, apples don't do that. They sort of remain, 
themselves unless you're using the ones that go can collapse into a sort of puree but you know while that's a kind of like advantage for the apple an advantage for the pear is that it 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 doesn't hold on to itself necessarily it takes on other flavors mm-hmm. and i sometimes people say to me what would be you know what would you have as your last meal and i find it very hard to think of anything but kind of like baked pears because they're just so delicious mm. those are the things i look forward to pomegranates as well because um well very annoyingly they're here year round now because everybody's obsessed with them um but i try to keep them just from now until christmas in this season yeah, yeah. and they're smoked Smoked fish. I love that. Oh my oh, goodness. Yeah. Because yeah. that's very kind of like that lovely bonfire flavor when you're cooking it on the hob. The children come in and they'll say, Oh, yeah, that's a kind of like the smell of now. But also all of those Christmas spices. Um, we don't have pumpkin spice here. Nobody kind of like has pumpkin lattes or anything like that. It's but, like pie, um, it's like just pie spice, right? It's just yeah, pie spice. But what, what I really like is a is a um a spice that's not very not used very much and i'll go back to i mentioned it earlier nutmeg yeah I think nutmeg is so good you can't overdo it because i don't know what happens it becomes it just becomes too much it needs to be subtle but i think that is that's a spice i really look forward mm. to using um, so we're not, we're almost out of time. I'm not going to have time to get to everyone's questions, unfortunately, but we've had a couple people ask about your favorite cookbooks. Who are your favorite food writers and any new books or favorite books of yours? Okay. Um, favorite food writers are Claudia Roden, who I kind of discovered her when I moved to London and Jane Grigson, who I probably wouldn't be a food writer if it wasn't for Jane Grigson. Because I was just looking at it recently because I was looking at all my favorite books and I realized that only five of them have been published in the last decade. <laughs> and not very many of them have got photographs. So there'll be people because we didn't we didn't kind of like demand them in those days. And now everybody wants oh, a recipe and a picture and a recipe and a picture. And you had to use your imagination when you read Jane Grigson. And my favorite book of hers is her fruit book. Jane Grigson's fruit book yeah. is wonderful. Her vegetable book is wonderful as well. Claudia Roden is, you know, I, I just think she's a goddess. And this will probably be surprising to people, but Alice Waters, not because of her writing, but because of the way she thought about food. I mean, when I found out who she was and I discovered her book in a, a bookshop just near my flat, we were in London in the middle of Nouvelle Cuisine. So everything was reduced stock, hexagonal plates, right. raspberry coulis everywhere. <laughs> or it was kind of more old-fashioned French than that. But that was what was going on at that time. And then I remember opening that up and seeing one of her menus, uh, the Chez Panisse menu cookbook. It was goat's cheese and, you know, um, baked garlic and olive oil rubbed bread. And then she went on to pork loin with griddle peppers and then she had these baked plums for pudding. It was just like, I mean, baked plums for pudding. That was just so different than what was happening at that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, something that plain seemed kind of like revolutionary. And I remember just a kind of like a shiver going down my spine because I thought, this is really great. This is about the essential taste of these ingredients. And I like that. I mean, she's had, yeah, a big influence on me right from yeah. the age of 20 current ones kind of new writers i really love olia hercules i think she's fantastic and her her books aren't only just from the heart and from a particular context i just think you just learn so much about specific techniques like fermenting and stuff from olia but it's not as if she's doing them like a scientist she's doing them because that's what she grew up with yeah um one of my favorite books from the last i wonder if it's sitting here from the last couple of years actually is the one about Afghan food. I think it's called Par- Parvana. Did you have Parvana. that? Parvana. Yeah. I don't, maybe it's it sitting, I don't have it sitting behind me. I was going to pull it up. But yeah, it's that's magnificent. It, well, it's just, this again, this is kind of like, I have no idea what this country tastes like. And it's partly Middle Eastern. And also it's got a lot of kind of um influence from India as well. Mm-hmm, so yeah. kind of parsley things. So when I got that, it was, oh my God, all the things I wanted to, to cook kind of, there's quite a lot of dried fruit in that as well. And it's, 
a lot of stews, but then wonderful flatbreads and flatbreads that are stuffed. It just seemed so rich to me, but also, I mean, it's home cooking, not my home cooking, but someone else's. But I, I look for that. I think mean, Falliston is sitting right behind me. Yeah. Uh, well, that is interesting because oh, my Morris, place, yeah. Oh, I, oh, sorry, that's a wrong one. <laughs> Here it is. Oh, no, this is over the wrong place. shoulder. <laughs> um, yeah, this. And he, I think it's a wonderful, I mean, a wonderful kind of like person to, I mean, I suppose it's very kind of like of the moment right now because it's, it's Palestinian food. Palestinian, yeah. But um, it's just, I think, I think it's interesting how other people's food can become yours because my children went off having roast chicken on a Sunday night, which is what I used to do because my ex-husband did it for them when they went to his, um, you know, apartment for the weekend. So they started calling it divorce chicken. Oh, and I had to find something else that would take place of divorce chicken. And so I wrote, <laughs> I started cooking, um, I started cooking Sammy's dish here that like, which is basically the national dish of Palestine. And um, it's, and he'd had it all growing up. So something that he had grown up with became something that my boys also grew yeah. up with. And I love that. I think, I think tasting other people's homes, other people's childhoods um, is incredible. I think it's an incredible privilege to be able to do it, but also to kind of like sort of, you know, for one meal, join their table. I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Oh, Diana. It's Are there one any more questions? Six. Well, we're we're out of time. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> we, we, I'm very that sorry. Hour flew by. It I was great. Um, I'll come back another time, and everybody can ask the questions that they didn't manage to ask. This no, time. it's all it's all great. Um, congratulations! This is release day in the U.S. So, um, yeah, I'm just I was so delighted when I saw this was happening. I was so happy. We didn't even get to talk about Laura Ingalls Wilder and how the first oh time I picked up no. this book. The first time I hooked, picked up this book, I saw, I was like, Rose Figs, Sugar Snow. And I was like, oh, is it that Sugar Snow? It's that Sugar Snow. <laughs> and it is that Sugar Snow. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, thank you so much for this. Thank you um, very much. Thank you for everybody who's joined us as well. Yes, thank you, thank you everyone for you. tuning in. Have your questions. And happy cold weather cooking. Cooking. Definitely yes. right time for it now here, I can tell you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.